Welcome. We're here today with Dr. Sandro Galea of Boston University. This is Common Health Live. This is the Common Health from the CSIS Bipartisan Alliance for Global Health Security, engaging senior leaders on questions of how to address our common health security challenges in this post-COVID moment. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm Jay Stephen Morrison, Senior Vice President here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS in Washington, D.C. Uh, this is Common Health Live. We're thrilled today to be joined by Dr. Sandro Galea. Uh, he is a physician, epidemiologist, author, and Dean and Robert Knox Professor at Boston University School of Public Health. Uh, he became the dean in 2015. He's one of the most widely cited scholars in the social sciences, published more than 1,000 scientific journal articles, 75 chapters, 24 books. Of special note for our purposes here at CSIS in this conversation, he's, he's concentrated much of his uh, academic work on the social causes of health, mental health, and trauma with a special focus on mass trauma and conflict worldwide across a diversity of settings, which, which I think was a quite apt preparation for dealing with the consequences of COVID-19, which we'll be discussing today. He authored and published uh, uh, at the end of last year, Within Reason, uh, a volume that we'll begin talking about uh, momentarily. Sandro, thank you so much for being with us today and coming to CSIS. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Uh, I want to start with your book, Within Reason. We had a long conversation about this over a podcast mm -hmm. that was terrific conversation. I think for our, for our audience, it would be useful for you to summarize the basic proposition uh, of Within Reason, the, the drift into illiberalism mm -hmm. and the decline of trust that you identified as, as a phenomenon within the field of public health during COVID. Describe for us what you mean. Yeah, I suppose I feel like the book title almost captures the entire proposition within reason, but the subtitle is a liberal public health for an illiberal time. So the fundamental proposition is that when COVID hit, it was this crisis of uh, unprecedented proportion. Nobody alive had actually been yeah. through a pandemic yeah. like this. And a lot of things happened, a lot of things happened quickly. And um, leaving aside the urgency of the first couple of months, as we settled into our patterns of dealing with COVID-19 as a society, with public health right in the middle of all this, that we lost our way a little bit. And I mm -hmm. call this illiberal. And mm -hmm. now I, I, I want to be careful about the word liberal. I don't mean liberal in the leftist sense. I don't mean liberal as a, as a proxy for Democrat. Yeah. By liberal, I mean building on Enlightenment era traditions. And that means building what we do on reason, being being free as much as possible from ideology, listening to a plurality of voices, centering the autonomy and the rights of individuals. And to my mind, that has always been what should animate us in public health and what mm -hmm. should animate what we do in public yes. health. And I argue in the book that we drifted from that. And you know, I think another part of the fundamental proposition of the book is captured in the title, in, this, in the or title, Within Reason, because... I'm careful not to offer too many prescriptions in the book, which I, mm -hmm. I realize for, mm -hmm. for a reader might be frustrating because I often get readers mm -hmm. saying, well, what should we have done? Yes. And I'm careful not to offer prescriptions because in my assessment, there is no easy answer to any of this. And I think the answers are all within reason. And the answers all should rest on robust public discussion and debate. So just for our, for our audience, describe what were the manifestations of illiberalism within the field? Give us three or four key examples mm -hmm. where, that, that kind of got you paying attention, sitting, sitting up and paying close attention to what was going on. Give us a few examples of yeah, illiberalism. Yeah, so let's talk about three examples. I think number one would be false certitude. I think uh, mm -hmm. the field, because the field was under pressure, and, and in the book I try to be very careful to acknowledge the pressures the field was under. Uh, the field leaned into false certitude, being saying one day our predictions are as follows mm -hmm. and we are pretty certain about this. And then the next day mm -hmm. saying, well, actually, we weren't so certain. Here's yeah. our next set of predictions. Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of false certitude. Number two is a contradiction without acknowledgement. And that builds a little bit on the false certitude, which is we 
as data evolved, we changed our mind, which is appropriate, mm -hmm. but we did not have the confidence to explain uncertainty to begin with. And as a result, the mind changing seemed abrupt and it confused people. Mm -hmm. I think number three was intolerance of disagreement, intolerance mm -hmm. of different viewpoints about mm -hmm. what we should do. And, and, and I think that came from a place where public health felt under such threat that we were worried that if we allowed the plurality of perspectives, people would be confused. And I think now- And that we threat have learned, was coming mostly from Trump? I think the threat was coming from everywhere. I think, first of all, there, mm -hmm. was, a, there was a very real sense of threat about people's lives are being lost. I yes. mean, there, there was, there's an immediacy to that. And I yeah. think we need to understand that and we need to have deep compassion for those who are on the right. front lines for doing that. So and there was, was also, fear, there was pervasive there was fear. fear. And there was also a moment though, when you, 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 you brought up Trump, when the president was using you know, the world's biggest bully pulpit, has been said many times, to really flirting with COVID denialism. I mean, yes. you know, the president I mean, acknowledged COVID, but then he was promoting treatments that were ineffective, right. pushing back on his own advisors. So I think that put public health on the defensive. And I think yeah. public health felt that the only way to counter that would be to lean into its own illiberal tendencies. Yes. So you've mentioned a few of the factors that drove this, fear, political leadership, the urgency, the mm -hmm. uncertainty. What else drove the push towards illiberalism? Well, I think mm -hmm. the um, you know, public health is always in a really interesting space, right? Because mm -hmm. public health succeeds when it's invisible. You know, the, the world is, is better because of the work of public health, because of the work of vaccination, the work of clean air, yes. clean water. So as a result, public health doesn't get much time in the limelight. All of a sudden, COVID happens and public health is on every front page every day. Right. And I think Was public that health- Was intoxicating? I think public health, well, intoxicating is a strong word. Let's say ill-prepared for that moment. Mm -hmm. The other element that was challenging, I think, for public health, but for all of us, really, mm -hmm. was the fact that this was the first large-scale crisis lived in a time when our predominant public square was social media. Mm -hmm. And social media is a very particular medium. It is a medium that rewards assertion over discussion. Mm -hmm. And you know, I go back to my point about false certitude. It's very difficult on social media to say, what we think is going to happen is the follows, but let us explain the caveats and the uncertainty around because social media doesn't reward that. Social media rewards us saying, here's what's going to happen and right. I'm sure of it. Right. So I think we struggled with knowing how to use that medium in this moment. So what were the consequences, do you think? Right, do you talk about yeah. trust, talk about alienation, talk about the polarization and the, yeah. the degree to which public health itself now has a particular negative stand with a large portion of our population. Yeah, you know, I'll start with anecdote, which is an anecdote I opened the book with, yes. and then, then we'll talk about yeah. data for a second. You know, I opened the book with this anecdote about a bakery close to my house, yes. which had a sign on the door sometime towards the end of 2021, which essentially said, the town has said that you should, don't need to wear a mask, but we disagree with the town, you should wear a mask. And the only reason I use that anecdote, which for many of us is almost like, yeah, we've seen that all around yeah. the place. Yeah is simply to remind us that in 2019, 2018, it would have been unthinkable for a non-health establishment to have a sign that says the health experts say X, but we think you should do Y. And now we've sort of come to accept that. So that's the anecdote. Now look at the data. The data reflect this. Trust in medical scientists, trust in public health, trust in authority has gone down dramatically over the course of COVID. Now, if you think about it, COVID was an enormous public health success story. We got to vaccines, mm -hmm. effective vaccines, multiple vaccines within eight months. Record. The time. fastest we had ever done this was three right. years. That was the fastest. So it was an extraordinary story. And public health mobilized quickly with rapid testing, contact tracing, isolation, all the fundamentals of public yes. health. So we should have emerged from this moment with trust in public health soaring, not declining, which I think then should make us say, why is that? What is going on? Yes. And when you look at the data, there is this alarming split between those who identify as Republican and those who identify as Democrats. Trust in medical science is down 25 points among those who identify as Republicans. When you look at Democrats, overall it's only down a few points, but if you look at black Democrats and Latino Democrats, down 10 to 15 points. Mm -hmm. So I think those numbers should make anyone who thinks about these things pause and say, mm -hmm. why is that? What is going on? And I think what these numbers are reflecting is that the public did not really see public health acting in its interest, even though public health was. Public health actually was acting in its interest. And I think that should make us say, what's going on? Why is that? Now, one of the things that you talk about in, in your book is the distance, the separation in class mm. 
between the field of public health and those most vulnerable. Yeah. And the consequence that has in terms of understanding the implications of, mm -hmm. of mandatory business closures yes. or disruptions in schooling and the like in terms of the burden borne. Take, yeah. so take the, a few minutes to describe yeah, let's break how, you, how you see the field as somewhat separate and mm -hmm. isolated in a way by status, by economic, mm -hmm. by economic privilege or benefits. Yeah, I think, it, I think it's always difficult, right, when those yes. who are in a position of decision-making position really do not have the lived experience that those who are experiencing yes. the decisions then go through. It's a problem with Congress all the time in this country. But yes. let's focus on public health. You know, one of the things that happened right after the um, we, COVID was, um, it, became, it became a thing, was it's an infectious disease, transmitted person to person, and we should think about how to limit the transmission. One of the things that uh, became really very quickly orthodoxy is that anyone who works from home, who could, who could work from home, should work from home, mm -hmm. which at face value sort of makes sense until you look carefully at the data. And the data before COVID, so we knew this before COVID, mm -hmm. this data from Bureau of Labor Statistics, yeah. where that those in the top 25% of income, a majority of those could work from home. But everybody else in the lower 75% of income in this country, it's only a minority of those people who actually could work from home. So when you adopt a policy that says if you can work from home, work from home, because there's an infectious disease, what you're effectively saying is we are protecting a particular group, which is the people in the top 25% of income, more than other groups. Now, mm -hmm. I'm often asked, well, what else could we have done? Mm -hmm. And I really do think it's a difficult question. I'm trying to be careful not to be, not to make the mistake that I'm myself decrying to say there's a clear assertive answer, because I do think it's a very difficult question. But I will remind us that we never really had this conversation when this happened. And we never really had the conversation that said, maybe until we get a grip on this for the first couple of weeks, Let's work from home as much as we can, but let's be aware that in so doing, we're exposing some people to more risk than others, mm -hmm. and that this is something that we should reverse very quickly as soon as we get a grip on it. And there's a big difference in our fear and our understanding of the disease in the end of March of 2020, say, versus beginning of May of 2020. Yes. But we did not have the dexterity, the intellectual dexterity to pivot because we leaned into these positions and then and then really developed an orthodoxy around them. How has this argument been received among your, your peers and, mm. and other faculty and students in the field of public health and the officials in public health? How, how has this yeah, I think analysis it, been received? I think in the main, I've actually been uh, grateful to my mm -hmm. peers and that uh, they've been willing to entertain the ideas. I've had many people who have said to me, I disagree with what you're saying, but I'm glad that you wrote it. And to be honest, that's all I ask for. I actually, I, I think, I think there's plenty of room for disagreement about what yes. I'm saying. And I say this in the book. I actually say explicitly in the book that I actually look forward to learning from others who analyze the situation differently. Right. But what was clear to me is that we should surface these questions and we should have this conversation. Yes. And and I'm looking for others to show me ways in which one can see what happened differently. So I suppose what I tried to do was to open up the conversation. You know, I think one of the criticisms of my writing this book has come from some colleagues who have said, well, there is a problem with turning your gaze onto the work of public health because you are exonerating, say, the media. You're exonerating politicians. Misinformation. You're, disinformation. You're, you're exonerating that. And my, my point is, I'm, I'm not exonerating these sectors. In fact, I, I acknowledge them in the book, but I also right. say in the book, that's not the sector within which I operate. And, and, and I think public health and the health establishment broadly needs to have the self-confidence to say, let us take a look at ourselves right. and also throw down the gauntlet and challenge the media to take a look at itself, challenge the political sector to take a look at right. itself, challenge the think tank sector to take a look at itself and say, if, if all these sectors can honestly examine what they did, what role they played and how they can mm -hmm. do better, I think it'll be better for mm -hmm. us as a world. Mm -hmm. I read recently um, Don McNe Don, Donald McNeil's book, The Wisdom of Plagues, mm -hmm. which just came out recently, which is another very mm -hmm. interesting reflection on what's happened and look back historically over uh, pandemics uh, through the decades. He's making an argument that one of the lessons from this period, he's calling for introspection and self-criticism mm -hmm. and, and, and taking another look 
But he's saying that the field needs to be much tougher politically. Mm -hmm. He's making the case that in the past, public health officials were much more inclined to be fairly authoritarian in their approaches, and that political assaults and this experience has melted that away, and he's saying, wait a second, Tr defending against these threats requires people to take, take a stand and hold their ground and be a little tougher mm -hmm. politically. What do you make of that argument? Yeah, I, I read his book as well. I, think it's, I also think it's a good book. And then the last chapter, I, I, I started diverging. Um, um, I like that argument, and I would mm -hmm. like to like that argument. And I think if public health is going to lean into that argument, then public health has to hold itself above reproach. One mm -hmm. of the terms which I've used um, in my other writing is that public health has a responsibility to be the adult in the room when everybody around is afraid. And to be the adult in the room, it means tolerating a lot of misbehavior. It means listening to a plurality of ideas. It means guiding people and being confident enough to yeah. show when you don't know. I think if public health can do that, then not only would it be good for society if public health take, took this more muscular yeah. role, I think society would be happy to have public health take that role. I think a lot of the tensions we've seen is because people have not been convinced that public health inhabited the role in a way they want to somebody who's going to take authority inhabit the role. We have a project here that we're doing jointly with Brown University, with Beth Cameron and Jennifer Nuzzo at Brown mm -hmm. University, and the, and the third party is the COVID Collaborative with Gary Edson and John Bridgeland. And that project is looking predominantly at four states in the United States, um, Indiana, Nebraska, uh, uh, North Carolina, Washington State. But we were also looking at Alaska and mm -hmm. Maine and Texas. And, and we're, the proposition there is that COVID's two stories, really. It's a story of failure and disappointment and mistakes and blunders, but it's also a story of ingenuity and courage and lamplighters, people mm -hmm. who in the midst of this darkness figured out ways to move forward and build new partnerships and create things that didn't exist before and the like. And I, I want to first ask you, you know, uh, the question, I mean, one of the things that emerged from a series of interviews uh, that we've had over the last year is the proposition that public health did best when it wasn't in charge. In other words, when mm -hmm. governors said, yes, public health has to be at the table, has to be empowered, has to, we have to listen, we have to respect, we have to, they have to have confidence, as you say. They need to be assertive, but you don't necessarily want them in charge. Mm -hmm. What do you make of that idea? Because there are several yeah. cases that you can point to where things went reasonably well, and it wasn't by political mm -hmm. identity. I mean. The performance it stayed the good performance in states was red states, blue states, purple states. It wasn't really according yeah. to political identity. You know, I've spent my entire academic my, my entire adult life in academic public health. So it's in my interest to say public health should be in charge, but I'm not sure public health should be in charge. Yeah. And I think this this is a philosophical uh, discussion. Yeah. I see the role of the scientist, let's talk about the population of yeah. scientists for a second, yeah. as analyzing the data and providing those who are in a position of authority and responsibility and accountability mm -hmm. to then weigh the pros and cons and weigh multiple inputs and make decisions accordingly. I think the, the, the question is one of transparency and accountability. And if you think mm -hmm. about it, mm -hmm. certainly population health scientists are not really accountable. I mean, public health scientists are working in universities where accountability is pretty fuzzy. Public health practitioners are implementing the work of population health science. It really, in our society, it is our elected leaders who are actually accountable for the decisions they right. make. Right. So I, I'm, I'm reluctant to say that anybody but elected leaders should be the ones who are ultimately making a decision because we don't have systems of accountability for any of the rest of us, even public health, regardless of how good our intentions are. Mm -hmm. You know, Jeffrey Rose, who's one of the sort of seminal figures in population health science has a quote, which is, you know, our job is to analyze the data so that society can then make the right decision, something like that. And I largely agree with that. That's what made, for example, the mantra, follow the science, so problematic during COVID. Now, taking a step back, I realize where it came from. It came from a place really of reaction to Trump, right? When you had a president who was 
very visible about disavowing science, that's a really difficult place to be. But accepting that, you know, follow the science suggests that the science points to one specific course of action. The science does no such thing. The science gives you a narrow answer about a narrow question. What the right thing to do is, is much more complicated. Let's use one example, which I use right, in the book. Right, a political choice that takes into account multiple, multiple factors. Let, let, let's take one that perhaps takes into account emotional inputs. Yes. Let's take the issue of, in a context of a pandemic, do you allow people to visit in hospital without a plastic wrap between you and them, dying loved ones? Mm -hmm. The science is very clear. You have a dying loved one, you have a greater risk of transmission of the virus if you visit dying loved ones. So the science would say, absolutely not. But how many of us want to live in a world where you can give your loved one a last hug and a last kiss? Mm -hmm. uh, it, that, that is not a scientific input. That is very much a human input. Now, mm -hmm. in saying this, one has to hope that those who are elected, those who are in a position of decision making, have the wisdom to make those kind of decisions. I think COVID, COVID challenged us in that uh, I don't think there was much confidence that those who were actually in decision making authority, position of decision making authority, had that kind of wisdom. But I would like to live in a society where those who we elect have that kind of wisdom. How, do, how does the field uh, move beyond the polarization and lack of trust right now? What's, what's it going to take, do you think? I think it's going to take a number of things. And I suppose I felt like one of the things it's going to take, first of all, is for public health and those who are engaged in the health enterprise to be honest about our shortcomings and to mm -hmm. engage in this kind of conversation. So in large mm -hmm. part, and I say this in the book, I wrote the book from a place of love. I wrote this mm -hmm. book from a place of someone who believes strongly in the mission of creating a healthier world, believes strongly in the role of academic public health and public health practice, and wants the public to trust us. But I, I don't think the public will trust us unless we say, look, let's look carefully at what we did wrong. Let's think about how we could do better. Let's have the humility to accept that there are things we may do better, but also have the confidence to say, if you, society at large, yeah. see us having this conversation, you will not lose more trust in us. You will simply say, we are actually thinking carefully, and that is appropriate for anybody who is entrusted with any societal responsibility. So you're leading Boston University School of Public Health. So you're, you're charged with thinking about mm. reforming or upgrading or modernizing curriculum. You're, you, you're charged with what's the balance of disciplines that we now need to deal with this world that we now see in the aftermath of the, uh, of the pandemic. We're in a world of misinformation, disinformation, conspiracy thinking. We're in a world that's so divided that requires political acumen of a different kind than we thought mm -hmm. was necessary before. Our, communi our communication capabilities our outreach capabilities have to be changed in some ways. Tell us how you're going about shaping the next generation of public health mm -hmm. leaders, because my expectation is that in 10 years' time, we're going to be dealing with adult practicing public health experts mm -hmm. who are coming out of schools like BU, and they're going to look different and think differently. Yeah, I think, I th I think they will. And I am, look, when I talk to our students, this what always gives me hope. They are better and more thoughtful mm -hmm. than their peers were 10 years ago. And um, you know, emerging from this moment of COVID, we are seeing the, the, the people who enter our school, leaving aside what we need to teach them, who are coming into it with eyes wide open. They are deeply committed to the mission of creating a healthier world where everyone can live long, rich, fulfilled mm -hmm. lives. But they also have been coming to us recognizing that getting there is not so straightforward. I think they... They're, they're value aligned with what public health is trying to do, but skeptical about how to get there. And that, to me, is fantastic foundation on, on which to build. Now you ask about you know, my responsibility to school. And one of the things that we're doing is trying to think about curricular. What does this mean? Right. Like yes. kind of, for example, one of the things that to my mind is we have shown to be pretty broken is how we teach communication, public health communication. Yes. I'm not sure that anybody has quite shown me what where we should go to mm -hmm. i'm pretty convinced that where we are right now is not quite right and this is going to evolve and this will evolve over the next few years right. and how do you deal with the with the distance between a, a graduate student and a faculty member at boston university is qu quite a far away quite far away from mm. a rural popu mm. popu population that's highly populous that distrusts them 
Yeah. How do you how do you g- cross that divide and 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 build a, a a greater identification or empathy and understanding and ability to engage with with a population that as we've talked about is so skeptical with difficulty and, and is the truth I, yes. think we, I think we all have a difficult time you know, yeah. you're, you're in Washington I'm in Boston yes. it's it's actually it's very hard to actually say what's it like if I lived day to day in Wyoming yeah and I think conversely it's hard in Wyoming to say what's it like living day to day in Massachusetts but I think um Certainly the first step is to talk about it. And you know, we talk about this all the time in our school. We've been very public about the fact that we need to make sure that a school of public health in, uh, in Massachusetts, which is a blue state, yes. needs to make sure that it's a welcoming, inclusive environment for people from red states, that yeah. we need to make sure there's space for political disagreement. That does not mean that people cannot have particular values that inform how they think. It simply means they want to have the space where people can have the conversations where they can try to find common ground. Yeah. And, we have been very, very visibly public about this at the school and to try to create an environment where people with different perspectives can get together. I, I, I will not say that we're perfect at it. I think we yeah. still have a lot, long way to go. But I've become pretty convinced that unless one labels it, unless one genuinely engages with these questions, uh, what ends up happening is we as humans end up drifting in one direction where we very quickly form orthodoxies of thought that reflect only the people around us. And of course, this has been well established in political science. When yeah. you look at voting enclaves where you know all yeah. Democrats know only Democrats, then they think there's only one perspective and vice versa for Republicans. I, 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 had, I joined a breakfast this morning up on Capitol Hill. Mm. I was with a prominent um, Republican member of the House, a uh, relatively young guy, mm. very talented, very, co- very urbane, uh, very accomplished mm. from a Midwest stayed in a leadership position in the House. And in the course of his remarks, he went through a series of talking points that were, I think, now official talking points within the Republican Party that was just a roundhouse condemnation of public health. Oof. I mean, it was, it was painful. Hmm. But it, that, that litany is being repeated on the campaign trail and being re- repeated at breakfasts and luncheons of this kind. And it went largely unchallenged, too. Mm. I mean, it was like, we just went through a period of repression. We just went mm. through a period in which our rights were abrogated and the wrong decisions were imposed on us, whether it's mandates on vaccines and masks, whether it is closure of businesses or closure of schools. And we're not going to do that again. And we're going to make sure that doesn't happen again. And I came out of there thinking, you know, this is the thinking that accounts for the rollback of the authorities of public health yeah. in two thirds or more of America's uh, states through state legislative action actions by the governors and the like. Um, it's a it's a really serious political challenge, and it it sort of crossed my mind. I knew I'd be talking to yeah. you, and I'm thinking, wow, how does Sandro deal with <laughs> this, right? Because you should have that congressman talking to your students, it seems to me, or at least playing video records of this is this is the world that's out there right now. A good part of America is talking in these terms, and they've got a kind of coherent battery of talking points that get rolled out on the, like, like bulletproof, I well, mean, bullet a, points. Yeah. This, is, this is a standing invitation to the congressman that uh, he would be more than welcome to come to our school. <laughs> and, I, and, and, and I actually mean that because I think it is important for our students to hear that. And I, I, I don't know exactly what he said, but I'm sure I will disagree with some things he said. I'm sure yes. I will agree with some things that what he said. Yeah. But it seems to me like even having that conversation, say, let's hear the things we disagree on, hear things we agree on. And, and it also, I mean, the fact that somebody who you describe as accomplished and, uh, and impressive would hold such viewpoints seems to me to really push public health to say, let us ask ourselves which from this is warranted. And I think having the confidence to push back on the criticisms that are unwarranted. I think think that's okay. I I am in no way, I mean, I've written about the need for a muscular public health, but I think a muscular public health comes from a place of confidence, which says we we are willing to, and we're open to, honestly open to, ask questions about how we did so that we can be better mm-hmm. without losing sight of the fact that public health did remarkable things during COVID. Yeah. And public health is a strong public health is a good for all of us. Well, there was acknowledgement, I want to add, there was acknowledgement that on the scientific and R&D side of things, Operation Warp Speed and other things, there were 
uh, vaccines there were achievements. and uh, great achievements of historic value. But I must say, I was just I was I, I was just reminded of how much this doctrinal indictment of public health has been embraced by uh, for political ends. Yes, and and repeat repeat it gets repeated by very smart people over and and respected people and it 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 sets off an a, a disquiet and alarm in me because i'm thinking gosh how are we going to how are we going to work with this how are we going to work around this how are we going to work to change this so that it, this doesn't not become permanent doctrine uh in a large part of america uh which i think it could no i think it could as well so first of all congressman you have a standing invitation. Just let me know. Yes. That's number one. Number two, uh, I, I think, you know, I thought carefully about when to write this book and how yes. to pitch this book. And obviously for a book to come out in end of 23, it was written in 22. You have to be careful with a book like this, not to write it too soon because people can't pay attention, not too late, and then people have moved yeah. on. Yeah. And at the same time, I've also been very much aware of the fact that there is a danger of a book like this being misused and being misused to say, you know, here is a, a wholesale criticism of public health. Yeah. So I've yeah. been trying to be very careful in my conversations to be clear that a book like this occupies a place of self-examination. And it's a place of self-examination that rests on the fundamental notion that the field has much to offer, has shown has so much to yeah. offer. And also really the only way to push back fundamentally at those who are using the field's shortcomings for political ends is to show that we are willing to examine ourselves and be better because mm -hmm. that strikes me as the way to make sure that the public recognizes that the contribution that we can make will evolve and will stay with us. Yes, thank you. I'd like to come back to the project that I referenced that we yeah. have together with Beth Cameron at Brown and Gary Edson and others at COVID Collaborative. I wanted to ask you, what, what as you were watching, you were writing uh, your, your, your uh, uh, frequent blogs that then became, were amalgamated and, and, and emerged as the, as the foundation for the book. You were watching what was evolving. And I wanted to ask you what you were seeing in terms of patterns of ingenuity hmm. uh, at state and local levels. And... What kind of leadership? I mean, we had, you've acknowledged that the pressures coming from a denialism at the level of the president was going to have a counter reaction in public health, right? Um, and, and that was going to lead to a closure of minds in some ways. But also, there was going to be the field, the responsibilities for finding solutions were all oftentimes sort of thrust upon state and local public health officials operating with elected officials and the like to come up with with solutions and the story that we're arguing of COVID is really two stories it's two truths it's the it's the truth of of failure and darkness and it's the truth of finding new ways forward what did you see in yeah. terms of ingenuity and innovation in leadership form uh what yeah. are there some instances you can point to that you found inspiring I like how you captured it, the story of uh, darkness, but also of ingenuity. It's really nice. I, I go back to something you said earlier, Steve, which I actually agree with, that my assessment, the places that did best are places where strong elected officials listened to public health, mm -hmm. put public health front and center, but then were, were not afraid to balance what public health did with other needs of their yes. communities. And and I think I'm reluctant to sort of name the person, person X, person Y, but I also agree that we saw those kind of good examples in cities, in red states and in blue states. Yeah. One of the areas of uh, research and scholarship I've done over the years has actually been on cities and cities and how cities affect health. Yes. And I've long felt that a lot of, in this country in particular, a lot of ingenuity, a lot of innovation, a lot of interesting efforts are arising in cities where you have particular mayors who work closely with public health, but then clearly have their own mind. I mean, in Boston, where I live, I have the privilege yeah. of chairing the Board of Health, which means yeah. sort of I, I oversee the health department. And, you know, our mayor And you did Boston, the same in New York. Uh, in, in New York, I, I was on the Board of Health. I didn't yeah. share it. Yeah. Um, um, you know, our mayor in Boston is, um, I think, strikes the right balance, where uh, mm -hmm. she's very clear that she has her own priorities, her own agenda, listens very carefully to public health. I don't always agree with her, but uh, I very much respect the fact that um, public health is heard 
and that it's her responsibility to balance multiple inputs. And to my mind, that's the direction that we want our cities to go. And I think that's where you have ingenuity and innovation. Now, we know there were these flashpoint issues that, that triggered division and controversy around schools, around workplace, uh, around masking and vaccine uptake. What did we need, as you look back, what did we need to put in, to have in place mm. that we didn't have in place to manage these? Because the next time the flashpoint issues are gonna be there, mm -hmm. right? I mean, people may not reach to, for mandates as quickly as they did yeah. earlier, but nonetheless, what do we need to have in place today that we didn't have in place during COVID? Well, I think knowing now what we know now, yeah. I think we need a lot more science. And I'm hoping that the next large scale pandemic takes a while so we can build the science. Yeah. The, one perfect example is mandates. Yeah. You know, we can have polemics all we want and you can have your opinion, I can have my opinion. I'm, I mean, I respect each other's opinion, but I care more about what does the science show us. I think there's a really yeah. interesting and important scientific question. Do mandates have the desired effect or not? Mm -hmm. There's been some early studies, for example, that have shown that actually mandates had the converse effect, which is once people were mandated, they were less likely to do it. Yep. There's been some other work that has shown that people were much more likely to change behavior spontaneously and then looked at scans at mandates. I don't know the answer. I don't think any scientist today can sit here in your studio and tell you definitively that we know the answer. So I, I think we need science on that. Okay. School closures is a good example. We, we, we suspected, but we did not have the data that we have now about the deep impact that school closures are going to have on kids mm -hmm. and about how hybrid learning is not even remotely a subsidy for personal yeah. learning. I, mean, I think most, most studies now are coalescing on the observation that students lost about six months of schooling on mm -hmm. average. Those six months are a range from one to two months to about 12 months, depending yeah. on whether or not they're, stu they're, they're schools that are well-resourced or not. So that science is emerging there. So I think we're at a place where we need science on these questions so we have a better body of science and i think we're at a place where we need to have the argument hashed out so that we've thought about it mm -hmm. you know somebody asks me not infrequently well what's your hope for the book my hope is that next time there is a crisis there is at least somebody in the room in any in all of these rooms who says are we thinking about trade-offs are we balancing these things and are we are we looking at it dispassionately, non-ideologically, to try to make sure that we really are mm -hmm. doing what we're trying to do, which is protect ourselves from disease, while also continuing to allow people to live their lives. Would that, would that new science that you're talking about, which I think is a great point, that really we need to, we need to scramble to fill those gaps, mm -hmm. would that then be the foundation for a new set of playbooks that would be yes. prepared for policymakers that where policymakers would have more of a game plan grounded in facts or studies that would give them more confidence. I think that's exactly right. And I think the playbooks that we had, which were you know, based on the science that we had, yeah. based on the models we had, were largely not useful because actually we did not anticipate an event like this. I mean, obviously they yeah. serve an issue. The other thing, the other uh, function science serves is it socializes those who are in public health practice. And it also informs elected officials who are more adjacent to health. You know, just like in Congress, there's a health yes. caucus and all that. Yeah. There are always influential people within leadership, within elected officialdom, who are pay more attention to health and their colleagues listen to them when yes. these things happen. So the science will shift how we think. You know, there's this concept of the Overton window, right? It's the things that are acceptable that we talk about. Well, that is shifted by two things. That is shifted by the data and that is shifted by, shifted by persuasive argument. I think we're at a point where we need to generate data and have the argument because the time to do that is now when we're not in an acute phase of pandemic. I, I would hate us to go through another pandemic where we are having these arguments when we are rapidly trying to protect ourselves from something that may kill us. Yes, thank you. Um, in the last phase of our conversation, I'd like to turn to some of the themes and topics that you've covered in your blogs, which are beautifully written and very easy to, easy to consume. <laughs> But you take, you've taken on, it seems to me, in your, in your responsibilities as a leader at BU and a leader in the field, you've taken on, the, 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 by choice, the, the responsibility to comment on some of the most difficult and, mm. and controversial topics. Uh, Hamas-Israel war, mm. uh, the, uh, violence against uh, LGBTQ, I mean, the next Benedict uh, death. Um, Tell us a bit about your 
your approach on that. I was I was struck mm. when you talked about um, Gaza and Hamas that you said something. Uh, I'm not gonna I'm gonna butcher the quote, but you said something around. I can't begin to know what I should know. Mm. Something along those yeah. lines. In other words, an admission of I find this so. It, we have to talk about this, but it's so difficult. Mm with the traumas on both sides and the complexities of this. Yeah, so first of all, thank you for reading. For anybody watching, it's The Healthiest Goldfish is the name of the blog. Um, you know, recently I wrote a piece about why write, which I, where I tried to grapple with some of these questions. Yes. And I, I articulated sort of these three points as to why I write when I write. Number one is when there's something which I feel is adjacent enough to what I do, what I have thought about, yes. that I have something to contribute. There, there are many, many things which I care about in my role as citizen that I, I don't comment on, that's number one. Number two, I feel like I have um, a pastoral responsibility. It's a term that was taught to me actually by a chaplain at our university. That um, you know, in the field, in my school, in the field, there's a responsibility to actually give voice to things that people are thinking about. And number three is, I think one writes when there is an opportunity to shed light. When there's an opportunity to shed light on on things around which there is noise. And and I try to be very honest in the writing to explain why I'm writing. That's why the point of the of Gaza, I mean, I started that piece with, um, it is such a difficult moment. It's so heartbreaking in so many ways that it's very difficult to find the words. And uh, and I was trying to be honest about that. That's mm -hmm. not a sort of a common thing to write. And I tried to also be honest that um, I have a set of values that guide my writing. I think my anybody who Googles what I've written, it's very clear what my value mm -hmm. set is. Um, um, and I tried to be upfront about that and explain how they inform what I write, but also try to be dispassionate and skeptical about the science and try to bring it together. So what I've been trying to do is to create space for an engaged conversation around issues that should matter to any of us who care about health. Thank you. Thank you. I've really enjoyed, um, I really do enjoy your blogs and, um, Thank you. and really appreciate them. One last question. You're Maltese. I am. Um, I, I feel like I have to bring a Malta question Please. to the table. <laughs> uh, the Malta and Barbados mm -hmm. are the lead, the leads on the high-level meeting on antimicrobial resistance that will mm -hmm. be held on the margins of the UN General Assembly in September. And the lead negotiators were here last week oh. to have a consultation, and they were. It was really fascinating listening to both of them talk about the difficulties of getting a political declaration together, the difficulties of operating in this environment and how they're approaching all of this. And and I was kind of scratching my head thinking, how did Malta and Barbados find themselves mm -hmm. in this position where they were tapped to do this? Because it's, first of all, it's, it's not guaranteed of success. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot of effort and a, a lot of effort to lead in this way. And one of the responses from the, the, the lead uh, uh, Mal, uh, Maltese negotiator, who was a former uh, defense minister, was, you know, w uh, during the collapse of Libya, during the Libyan crisis, we, have, we medevaced uh, victims uh, of the violence into the hospital, uh, in, main hospital in Malta, and suddenly we found we had introduced uh, highly resistant organisms into that setting, and we had to deal with it, and it was just hugely disruptive, and it left a deep imprint in the high-level leadership mm -hmm. at the country, and that sort of got us thinking about, as a small society, as an island community, as a you know the, mm -hmm. that these are these are threats that that are in some ways better understood uh, than they are in Indonesia or Brazil. Um, I just wanted to put to, out to you. Yeah. First of all, I thought that was an interesting anecdote yeah. as to the origin mm -hmm. of the interest coming from there, but also this observation that while AMR, there's a lot of momentum around AMR in North America and in, and in Europe and in Britain, we see less momentum in the big lower and middle income countries. And yet the proposition is that smaller, smaller countries in low and middle income ranks may be much more open to mm. thinking about this because just their own experience in climate change is, mm -hmm. is around those lines. I just wanted to ask yeah. you. I mean, I, I don't know what the political um, alignment, the result of multiple yes. together, but you know, they're both small island states. Yes. 
and as, as we were discussing earlier, Steve, it's hard to, it's really hard for us as humans, right, to see the world through the eyes of others of different experiences. And you know, being a small island is a very particular view on the world. Yes. And uh, it, is, um, it is one where one recognizes that there are threats to you that are much larger than you are and that you're, you're never going to have the size to be able to aspire to actually push back on these threats. So th there is almost an imperative for you to figure out a way to engage with the global community to help mitigate those threats. And, you know, Malta has 300,000, 400,000 people, so it's a really it's a very small uh, place. And you tend to grow up seeing the world that way. So I'm actually delighted that uh, Maltese, that you have had people with my accent in, uh, in your studio <laughs> two weeks in a row. <laughs> well, thank you. Let's close with the question that we try and uh, put at the conclusion of all of these conversations, which is what gives you the greatest hope and optimism today in your position yeah. as a prominent intellectual and teacher and leader and dean in this field of public health at this moment in time, what gives you the greatest hope and optimism? I think two things. I think number one, it's the students, the next generation. I mean, they are great. They are just mm -hmm. better than we were. And uh, that is fantastic. And number two is the very fact we're having this conversation. I, 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 really, um, I, I really believe in the power of conversation in societies. And, uh, and it is critical that we do that to move ideas forward. So I'm grateful to you for having the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. And again, congratulations on the book, Thank Within you. Reason. It's a terrific book. Um, I really have enjoyed it, and I think it's a valuable contribution. So thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you.